Okay, welcome to the Starboard Portal for our live show today. I'm Betsy Allison, the Director of Adult Programs at U.S. Sailing. For those joining us who are members tuning in, thank you, because you know membership does matter. Please support our efforts to build a community of active and engaged sailors through the Starboard Portal by purchasing or renewing a U.S. Sailing membership today. Visit us at ussailing.org and join U.S. Sailing. And now on to our our show today. I want to introduce you to Captain Donald Lawson. As a nine-year-old black youth in a sea of white faces, Captain Lawson set out on a quest to sail solo around the world. Today, he continues on that quest and is going to make a difference through education and inclusion using the sport of sailing he is passionate about. Now, with thousands of miles under his keel, he sets out to tackle the open ocean in an effort to set multiple records while sailing around the world and taking us along on his journey. We welcome Capital, Captain Donald Lawson to the Starboard Portal. Welcome. Hello, Betsy. How are you today? I am very well. I know our viewers are really excited to hear about your, uh, your Dark Seas presentation. So here you go. Well, thank you so much, Betsy. Um, first, I want to thank U.S. Sailing, uh, Betsy, Jake, Brittany, and uh, Justine for providing this opportunity to talk to everyone. Uh, I know it's a difficult time for everyone right now with the virus and all of us kind of quarantine right now. But hopefully, this presentation uh, provides a, a way of getting away from some of the stresses of life and hopefully just inspires some folks to uh, pursue their dreams and, and try to be all they can be. Um, it's important to remember we're really one family, now, not just here in the States, but also abroad, because I have some friends abroad watching this as well. And um, I just wanted to say, you know, we're praying for everyone. We hope everyone is doing well. And, um, you know, hopefully this presentation again provides some inspiration for everyone. Um, so I want to start the presentation with one word, kind of a word that helps the table for this presentation. And we're going to start with the word legacy. Um, because we're all going to be here for a certain amount of time and then we pass on, we move on. And we're trying, we should all try to leave as well as a better place, try to inspire the next generation. And so what you'll notice about this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, a number of people who inspired me, uh, a number of people who helped me get to where I am today. And then from there, talk about how I'm trying to pass that and pay that forward to the next generation. So, uh, so let's jump right in. Um, and a quick note, there are a lot of folks listening today who are sailors and a lot of folks who are not. And so I'm going to try to present this in a fashion like I would do for an intro class where you are sailing, where uh, we're going to take our time and walk through a few things. Uh, there will be two Q&A sessions, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to you know, come in the chat, and, uh, and Betsy will uh, bring me later on the questions. So, here we go. So, work here, and there we go. All right, so some folks who are watching this now are probably watching this after the live feed. So, this is a table of contents to try to give everyone an overview of the different topics in the presentation. So, if you're coming later on, you're watching this a week or two later, just uh, you can go to the perspective sections to see this information here. So who am I? So uh, as Betsy mentioned, I started sailing when I was nine years old at Living Classroom Foundation in Baltimore. And it was very interesting because I don't come from a sailing family. I don't come from uh, a uh, family that is out in the water very much. Uh, my family is very much athletes and I was the worst of the family and athletes, but uh, I found a niche early on as a sailor uh, because I was able to explore and be free and go out in the water. And one of the cool things that happened was uh, the skipper of the boat, the Lady Merlin, they, uh, he told me I could technically sail around the world at nine years old. And that's what set the foundation for my uh, future. I started working towards that as a young age. And my parents um, were the ones who pushed me to uh, pursue it. And um, I got to join Naval ROTC and I got to work on both designs. And it was one of those things where I was able to actually um, 
learned so much about the industry and the boats just by being a student and going out there and sailing with the boats. So from there, I uh, went on and uh, started teaching at the downtown sailing center. And I started teaching um, students, uh, inner city kids, disabled sailors. And, and um, from there, I went to getaway sailing in Baltimore, and then I was able to move on to US Naval Academy and teach there as well. Uh, so some of the images here, just multi-hall championship trophies that uh, I was able to win twice with the pool team on wild card. Uh, my captain's certification from a Napa School of Seamanship. And it's a cool picture of me uh, when I was on uh, Jim O'Dean's Sony Brook boat. So, going to the next slide here. This is some images, uh, some of the sailing I've been able to do in my career. Uh, and you'll notice I've been able to sail on a vast number of boats, open 60s, uh, some maxis, some multi hulls. Uh, trimarans and catamarans, which I'm very passionate about. I've also been able to sail on a number of day sailors like J22s, J24s. Uh, but I've fallen in love with high performance boats, boats that are really fast because I enjoy the feeling of freedom, the feeling of getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And also, which I'll talk about later on, you're able to do so much stuff on smaller boats particularly multi-hulls. And uh, as you see on some of the larger boats here with larger crews, you are specifically with one job. And so uh, I'm gonna get to a little more into that in a second as well. So from there, go on to the next slide here. I was inspired at a young age by some of the folks that came before me. And I know in sailing, you don't see a lot of African Americans in the media or on TV. But there were two gentlemen that came before me that were very important for the legacy of my culture and sailing. And the first gentleman's name is Captain Terry Seymour. And um, he's from, he was from New York. And he decided in 1986 that he wanted to sail around the world in 1987. And that voyage officially made him the first uh, African American to sail around the world solo. And so what that found, it inspired me and told me that there was an opportunity for me too to try to go out there and you know raise the bar even higher for the next generation. And so one of the cool things about our culture as well is that I'm not the only one. Back in 2001, I think it was, I met a gentleman named Captain Marcus Asante. Uh, he's coming dear friend of mine actually, and he had created a club called the Universal Sailing Club, which focuses mainly on trying to get more minorities into sailing, but also to help the community get out and also do regattas and educational programs. And one of the cool programs he started was actually the Maritime uh, Studies Program uh, Arts Workshop, where he works with young people, teaching them how to fix boats and stuff. And one of the cool things about that is that Marcus also happens to be a graduate of the landing school, and uh, which is a big maritime school up north. And so he took his education, and now he's teaching the next generation of sailors how to do the things that he learned. And so uh, I feel very privileged to work with Marcus, and uh, Marcus has uh, agreed to work with me on my project, which is really cool. And so uh, kudos to Marcus, all the work he does. Another buddy of mine is Captain Rob, and he, is uh, he's been a captain for a very long time. He actually worked on the Chesapeake Lightship. Uh, <laughs> so, no, no offense, Rob, that's a long time ago. <laughs> and he started this business, Chesapeake Flotilla, where he literally teaches people how to operate boats. And you know, I spoke to him maybe 12, 15 years ago. And the information and the passion he had for his work you know, resonate with me. And we stayed in contact for years and we still talk um, off and on social media, but he's another brother out there putting in work and, um, and it's really appreciated. And then uh, the OG of the group, the guy who, if you have any question about maritime history or about uh, people who came before us, what they've done, that'd be Captain Ross. And Captain Ross is a veteran. He served in Vietnam 
as a Marine. And after the Vietnam War, uh, he took on sailing and he began sailing all around the world. He started to actually uh, see and interact with people in different countries and stuff. And so when you travel to different places, chances are people are going to know Captain Ross and he's going to know about the history of the, of the centers and the boats there and stuff. So uh, if you're interested in learning about sailing history, uh, you should try to uh, connect with him on Facebook and stuff. And he's, he is the guy to ask questions about uh, sailing in maritime history. And on the right-hand side of the screen here, I just listed a couple of the sailing uh, African-American minority sailing clubs in the, uh, the country. Uh, and a lot of folks don't know this, but uh, there's a lot of African-Americans out there sailing generally every day so it's not quarantine, of course. <laughs> and these clubs have been around for a long time. Uh, they host regattas, they host uh, cruising events. Uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of members actually went to the Mediterranean and cruised around Greece, I believe it was. So uh, the clubs are out there, individuals are out there. Um, and our goal is to try to keep inspiring more and more minorities you to get into the sport of sailing. So from there, from those individuals, the people, professional sailors I met that had a lasting effect on me. Um, the first person uh, was Ellen McArthur. Um, for those who followed sailing back in the early 2000s, uh, she was the Michael Phelps, if you will, of sailing. Uh, she was dominant. She, um, was very young at the time, and, um, but she managed to finish second in the Vendée Globe. She went around the world, took the fastest time around the world for any person, not just male or female, but any person. And I got to meet her when I was teaching at the Downtown Sailing Center, and I got a chance to actually talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. And she set the ground, kind of the foundation for me on how to pursue a career. And I asked her, face-to-face, uh, -face, her and Mark Turner, her partner, I said, um, what do I have to do to be where you are? And it kind of threw off a little bit because it's probably an odd question from a 20-year-old you know, kid, but uh, she laid up a really good profile for me to follow. She said, do this, do this, do this, do this. Get on these kind of boats, get on these kind of people. And if you do that, you'll put yourself in a position to be successful. And so, who am I to say no to her? <laughs> I saw her, her directions and I began doing that. And that led me to uh, one of my role models, one of the guys who uh, inspired me, gave me a chance, opportunity that uh, most people don't get. And that would be uh, Bruce Schwab. Um, and again, for sailors from the early 2000s, mid 2000s, you'll remember him as a gentleman who went around the world twice solo not just once but twice, he did the Round Alone, um, I think that was in 203, and then he went around the world in the Vendee Globe in 04, 05, and became the first American to finish that race. Uh, he came in ninth place, uh, I believe he set the record for American at 107 days at the time. And the cool thing about Bruce is that um, when I met him in Napa's boat show, uh, he took me, took me under his wing and immediately, like the next day, called me and flew me up to Maine and just started teaching me the ropes. And um, I got to see how to run an operation, how to take care of a boat, how to fix the boat. And then from there, he gave me the opportunity to actually sail with him on his boat. And I got to sail with him from Portland, Maine, all the way down to Key West. And, um, and that was a life-changing experience because I got to see firsthand how to run an you know, organization and a program. And um, so I'm in debt to Bruce for that experience. Um, he, his company now is called Ocean Planet Energy, where they install eco-friendly systems on boats. And so I have a uh, keen desire to have him do some modifications on my boat because he's still the best in the country at what he does. So thank you, Bruce, for that. And so when I uh, was teaching uh, in Maryland, I got a chance to meet Pete. <laughs> at the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, Pete and I used to race against each other a lot. He, uh, he uh, led the offshore team on this giant boat called the Rafa, and um, I would race in the multi-haul fleet. And uh, it was always between his boat and our boat, finishing first across the line. And I remember one time he beat us across the line 
in the Oxford race by like 10 seconds when we had been leading the race the entire time. And he just got on me and teased me so much. And then I ended up working for him <laughs> at the Naval Academy as an instructor. And, uh, and Pete actually took time with me as well, where he actually taught me so much about, again, running organizations, how to take care of boats, how to lead a team, how to skipper a boat. And one of the best things he also did for me was he actually took a sheet of paper, which I still have in my, in my room over there, where he broke down all the different races on the East Coast and told me which ones I need to look at, which one I need to do to keep developing my skills. And so uh, another guy I still harass a little bit on LinkedIn, uh, just every once in a while to say hi and stuff. But uh, you know, he, he was a good rival, <laughs> but also a great mentor as well. So I thank Pete for his support as well. And um, finally, one of the other guys who, uh, if you're from California in particular, you know uh, Tim Lane because he uh, won so many championships and regattas racing catamarans around the country. And uh, he took me on his boat uh, in 2009, I believe it was. And uh, it was a Reynolds 33 catamaran called Wildcard. And we raced and sailed together for about four years. In those four years, we won back to back championships. Uh, it would have been three, but we broke a mass in the Governor's Cup one year. But um, it was a really cool experience because on his boat, I got to do pretty much everything. I got to expand my skill sets and test out my knowledge on his boat. And so uh, Tim and I um, had some really, really uh, great stories about some of the races we came back and won or some of the races when we clinched all three championships one time. It was, it was really cool. So uh, Tim was a really good uh, friend and mentor for me as well. So I thank Tim for his time and effort as well. And so all that leads me to uh, right there. So my background as a whole. Um, as I mentioned, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, born and raised. Uh, I've been sailing for about 29 years. And uh, one of the cool things is that um, I got to teach at all these different schools and stuff. I got to work with so many different people. And uh, part of the cool stuff is that by you, when you work with these different folks, that actually gets you in contact with other people and then you get to scale with them on their boats. And so I've been all over Europe, Mediterranean, Caribbean now, uh, up and down the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico, of course. And I've been able to do so many different deliveries and different trips and stuff. And so uh, I really am really appreciative of everyone who supports me. Uh, the individuals you see on the screen here are my current partners, people that uh, are supporting my record program, which I'll tell you more about in a few minutes. Um, in particular, I want to get them to thank US Sailing for their support. Uh, I actually, uh, they invited me to join uh, Deborah, the committee chair for the diversity and inclusion uh, committee, invited me to join so that I could pass on some of the knowledge and experience I accumulated and uh, help US Sailing as they continue to broaden their diversity and inclusion. And uh, so give you an idea about some of our partners um, right there. So from hearing all the stories and seeing the partners I have, uh, there came a time when people began asking me, uh, hey, can you show me footage? Can you come to our school and present? Can you, you know, share your story with us? And it got to a point where I said, you know, I need to probably consolidate all these stories all these pictures and videos into one documentary. And so I reached out to an organization called the Independent Arts and Media uh, Group, um, IEM, the short uh, California. And I told them about my story, what I'm doing, how I'm going to do it. And they agreed to partner with me and help me make this happen. And so this, the title of the documentary is called Dark Seas, The Voices of Captain Donald Lawson, where now I can consolidate this information. And the goal is to produce this documentary where I can share it with students, families, kids all around the world for free forever. And so that they could take my story, take the people I met while how I interacted with them, and they can watch it over and over again, much like I do when I watch you know, Tiger Woods stuff or Michael Jordan's documentary. You know, hopefully that by people seeing what I've done and who I've worked with, that will leave them 
down a path not to become a sailor per se, if that's what they want to do, that's great too, but inspire them to be the best they can be and be all they can be. And so uh, there's a link for the documentary in my, on my social media page uh, if you want to check it out. Uh, but this is the documentary here. So I'm going to pause right here uh, for a few minutes. And if there's any questions, uh, please type them into the chat box. And, uh, and Betsy uh, will, um, Betsy will uh, ask the questions on your behalf. OK. So Captain Lawson, I'm going to ask the big pink elephant question in the room. So here you are, a nine-year-old black boy in a very non-conventional sport for an African-American child. Most people would think that you would be playing hoops in the park, that you would be playing football, baseball, another sport where we see a lot of minority players. How is it that you came to be involved with sailing as a nine-year-old in Baltimore? And how did it feel to be a, a young black boy in a very uh, white sailing environment, sailing on a tall ship? Great question. Um, so I have to go back to my mother because <laughs> uh, she's the one who uh, got me into it. Uh, I was a camp counselor, sorry, my mother was a camp counselor for a program called the Police Athletic League, POW, I think it was called. And there was a field trip to the living classroom. And so living classroom, they had this um, schooner called the uh, Lady Merlin. And I got to go sailing for the first time. And it's important, I played basketball, just not very well. <laughs> and so when you grow up in a family where you have great athletes, like my siblings, all of them were all county, all Americans and stuff. You know, I had to find my spot. And I didn't start racing until about 2000. I went up to the downtown sailing center. Uh, but up from the living classroom time at age nine, so let's say age 29, I went from cruising and, and, and taking classes to actually racing a lot. And the hard part was always finding someone to sail with. Um, because a lot of times uh, when you're teaching and you're new and you don't know a lot of folks, they don't know you, you have to go by yourself. And so I started doing a lot of solo sailing during that time period. Uh, I was not going to stop sailing <laughs> because I loved it. Um, but if I couldn't find one to sail with, then you go by yourself. And what happened when I was doing that, I started developing my skill set. I started reading lots of books. Uh, studying a lot of documentaries, uh, studying a lot of techniques from some of my favorite sailors, uh, particularly a couple of guys out of France, like Frank Camas and Lac Peron. I started studying their, their skill sets and I started applying it to my sailing. And what happened, people started taking notice of it. And so uh, there was a gentleman named uh, Kurt Culberson who used to run the downtown sailing center. And um, he took me in as well and started teaching me stuff and allowing me to sail the boat. And then from there, I got Scott Livingston and Jack Lynch and all these guys started taking me out in these CNC 30s and C105s and stuff. And I started to expand my knowledge. And, my, and as people started seeing me out there, I would get invites. And so I had to earn my spot. Uh, people weren't going to just give me a spot on the boat because they're trying to win races. But the fact that I was willing to put the work in and they saw I was willing to put the work in, Folks start giving me opportunities. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, no, that, that what a great answer. And and honestly, some of the um, experiences you have are not different than what a lot of people have experienced. When you're new to the sport, it's harder to get those opportunities until you can prove yourself, the chicken and the egg. Well, we have a question that came in. You seem to have made your own way to meet the right people and get the information and knowledge that you wanted. What kind of advice do you have for others that want to get into our sport? And, you know, in, in that vein, especially people of color, you know, whether they're black, Hispanic, whatever, how can we encourage them to get more involved with our sport? A great question. So one of the key things in my culture is a fear of water. A lot of folks, Unfortunately, don't like being into the water for different reasons, so they shy away from boats. 
so what I used to tell students all the time uh, from the inner city was that if you wear a life jacket, I can get you out of water generally within 15 to 20 seconds, uh, depending on how fast we're going. And so for people who are nervous about just water to itself, there are different mechanisms we have in place. And U.S. Sailing teaches a great course on uh, safety at sea, uh, which I've taken a couple of times, where there are ways to stay, to stay safe while you're on the boat. There's no reason to fear being on the boat or being on the water. Uh, from there, the other part being is that there's opportunities in the industry for careers. And I mentioned some of the gentlemen, like Captain Rob, Captain Ross, uh, Captain Mark Santi, who they make a living doing work on the, on the boats and on the water. And so if you're looking for a career that allows you to be out in nature and be one with you know, the water and, and have some freedom and peace of mind, then the marine industry actually is a really good industry to go into. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are instructors and teachers around the world. I have of course, a bunch of friends who are professional sailors and stuff. Um, I think the number one currency that people need to know about is opportunity. And there are opportunities out there to go in the water. I mentioned some of the sailing clubs as well. Uh, there's clubs, at least clubs are out there and they're always looking for new members. Uh, most of these boats, which I'm going to go over in a few minutes, most of these boats require large crews. And so uh, if you're new to sailing, chances are they're going to teach you what you need to know. And if you like it and you get along with the crew, they'll invite you back. And then you keep earning your spots over time. So I, I think sailing um, is what has been one of the greatest teachers of life for me, uh, where I've learned a lot of uh, great traits and qualities. And um, also been able to learn how to communicate and work with folks uh, that are different. And so um, I would say if you're interested in travel, you're interested in uh, adventure, your feeling is probably the best sport for you. Great, well, we have another question that came in. Uh, someone wants to know if you were captain of the Navy ROTC and did you build robots in high school? <laughs> yes to both of those uh, so uh, in high school I went to Whitlawn uh, High School I was in an engineering program um, ironically that's where I met my uh, high school sweetheart as well um, and to impress her I actually joined a number of uh, extracurricular activities and one of them was um, the solar, solar car project, we, we built a uh, car that was powered by solar power. And uh, this was at the beginning of my eco-friendly mindset, actually. And we, would build, we built this car, and we competed nationally against other schools and colleges. And uh, both years, we came in sixth place, but uh, we did pretty well uh, as um, you know, juniors and high school uh, students building this car. Uh, ROTC, uh, so I wanted to go into the Navy very, very badly. Uh, but a key fact for everyone is I actually have asthma. And so I couldn't uh, actually go through with the commission um, that I had actually earned to get in. Uh, they did put me into the prep school, but you know, it just wouldn't, didn't work out. So, uh, which is ironic, I went to teach at the Naval Academy a couple of years later. But, um, but no, the ROTC program was a great program for me. Um, I did eventually become the commanding officer for two years. Uh, and then I also, uh, Went on to win the state science fair uh, three times in a row for, uh, well, two times in a row uh, for uh, boat designs. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, my high school time. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, a, 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 a quick question. So, you're a man who definitely sets goals for yourself and achieves them. Yeah. And one of those goals, I know, is to sail nonstop around the world and set a record. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about this in, in session two, but before we get into that and, and your, your goals for record setting, what kind of advice can you give on the process of goal setting? You know, oh, a, yeah. a snapshot view into how you would set some goals and go after achieving them, because, you know, a lot of what you've said are pretty lofty goals, but by, by golly, you've been able to really, you know, step up and achieve a lot of what you set out for yourself. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, thanks for asking that. Um, so 
when I was growing up as a child, my father had a philosophy that you had to do something. <laughs> you're not going to be lazy. You're not going to sit, sit around the house and do nothing. You have to do something. And what that instilled in my head, or all of our heads, was that we have to have something to project to, something to work toward. And when I, as a nine-year-old, was told I could sail around the world, that became my goal. And without goals, you kind of just walk through life, you know, and, you know, and sailing, when you're out in the ocean, and if you don't have a rudder or a tiller to steal your boat with, the waves just push you wherever it wants to go. And in life, a lot of folks, unfortunately, go through that problem where they don't have a target, a purpose, a focus. And one of the things I talk about a lot in my talks with people and groups is that you got to have a purpose. You have to fulfill the destiny that you're supposed to live through. Mine happens to be to do my records around the world, but someone else's could be to start a business or to raise a family in a certain way or you know, the doctoral degree in college. I mean, but whatever you aspire to do, you have to work toward it. And as I mentioned, sailing is a teacher of life because when we start regattas a lot of times, everyone has the hope of winning a regatta, winning that particular regatta. But what separates the top tier people sometimes from the bottom tier is that people at the bottom give up when they have one bad race. You know, most times you do it in a certain number of races in a regatta, you get to throw a couple of races out. But sometimes people, they'll lose one race. You know, then they'll say, oh, well, that's it. <laughs> and they give up. But people who stick with it, who keep fighting through, eventually you will come off the top. And there's been so many people. One of my favorite sailors is um, Thomas Coville. Uh, he's the skipper of uh, Babel, which is a large trimaran. And um, he went around the world four times, I think it was, and did not break the record. He completed his voyage four times and did not break the record. But the fifth time he went around the world, he broke the record. And that stick to witness allowed him to achieve his goal. And so I have had a lot of things try to stop me over the years, um, whether it's family or friends or people that I know. And you know, I've had people send me very negative messages before. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I know what I want to achieve. I know what I'm going to achieve. I know how I'm going to do it. So I go do it. And so that's, uh, I would suggest everyone to start taking on that, that mentality of once you know what you want to do in life, what you need to achieve in life, you go do it. Super. Well, we've got about 25 minutes left, and I know you want to get into your uh, session too. Something to think about while you're presenting, and we'll answer the questions at the end. One is, do you have a desire to sail nonstop around the world? And I know you're going to answer that question as you <laughs> present. And people also were wondering what your biggest challenge you've ever faced in your career and how you overcame it. And I'm pretty sure we're going to hear about that as we go into session two. Absolutely. So actually, that actually leads us right into section two, because um, I get asked a lot of times why I prefer offshore sailing and short-handed sailing. And there's a couple of reasons why. First, when you're short-handed on a boat, you have to do more jobs. Um, I don't have any kids, so I, I use this example based on what I see from others. But when you are a stay-at-home mom or father and you're taking care of kids, you have to do you have so many different hats you have to wear. And you have to get them done because people are depending on you. And the same thing in shorthanded sailing. When you're on a team of three, when you're on a giant boat, you have to steer the boat sometimes. Sometimes you have to adjust the sail. Sometimes you have to fix things. So, those difficult moments allow you to develop your skill set. And you, you'll keep hearing me say that challenges, if you stick with them, will help you become better. Because I was not a great navigator when I first started, but after screwing up a couple of times and making mistakes and learning from other po folks, I was able to actually get better at it. And so you gotta keep fighting with it. And shorthand scaling allows you to do that. Also, longer voyages, offer you more opportunities on the offshore to actually test and see things. Because if you go to a day sail and you're out there for a couple hours and you come back home, some of the stuff you did, you're going to forget. I've had classes where I've taught students and they'll hear what I say on Monday but forget it by Tuesday because they have other things going on in life. But when you're out there for four or five days, 
you know, some of the habits and things you develop, you get to repeat over and over again, and you develop your skill set. And one of the cool things too, and I say cool, but it may not sound cool to everyone, but when you're out there on offshore in the oceans, on passages, you don't get to go back to a hotel and take a shower and get a massage and relax. When you're out there, you're out there. And a lot of times when you depart a city or a town, you're going to a new one. <laughs> and so you have to get to that destination. And so there's no breaks, it's nonstop full on adventure. And I always mention freedom and freedom and independence as well. Because when you're out there, you're in the middle of the ocean, there's no one else out there but you. It's just you. And when you're on a team, it's just you and your team. And your team becomes your family. And when you're out there with a team, you know, I have here race, gender, sexual orientation, none of that matters. Because at the end of the day, you're all each other had. And so uh, I always encourage people who are nervous, well, I'm a, a young lady, or I'm gay, or none of that matters when you're out there. We're on the same team, we'll get through this together, and that camaraderie helps you to overcome difficult challenges. And so from there, one of the little secrets I'll pass on to everyone here, well, I spoke to Ellen McArthur, uh about my direction for my career. She had just won a uh, transatlantic race called the EBS Atlantic Challenge. And that was pretty much her last race on her uh, old King Fisher boat, Monohull. And she was going on to build a trimaran. And she told me, if you get a chance, try the race on multi-hull. And she said, the reason why is because you need less people to go faster. <laughs> and I didn't understand that at the time. I, how could I? I was you know, young. But I have a picture right here of two different boats here. And for non-sailors, what you're probably used to seeing on TV is a boat, it was a bathtub kind of thing. We call those monohulls, single hulls. And you're used to probably seeing catamarans or trimarans which have two or three hulls. And so the picture on, on the left here, Massif, is a trimaran. The monohull on the right is Comanche. And both boats are 100 feet long. But you'll notice on Comanche, I believe it's like 15 people on board. And those 15 are some of the best sailors in the world on that boat. And they actually did in 24 hours, they traveled 618 miles. On the other, other side, Massif, 100 foot boat, did 850 miles in 24 hours. And that was done single handed by one guy, Francis Cabar. And so the biggest difference in the designs is that monohulls traditionally have what's called a keel or a heavy lead weight under the boat to keep the boat upright. And without going too deep into it, that weight counteracts the sails to keep the boat upright. On the trimaran, the outside hulls, kind of like training wheels on a bicycle, keeps the boat from slipping over. And so the less weight and what we call riding moment, riding moment um, which is higher on the trimaran, allows the boat to go faster. And so one of my favorite quotes, and you'll see me quote a lot of Navy guys, um, is from uh, Captain uh, Paul Jones about having a fast ship because there are benefits to having fast boats, which I'll go over in a second. Um, and just so this is a visual here for everyone to see the difference between trimarans and catamarans. Um, the catamaran on the right hand side here is wild card. That's the boat I raced on one back to back ships with. Uh, that's a PlayStation that was uh, owned by the late Steve Fawcett. And then on the left-hand side, you see uh, me on some Corsair trimarans, a 28-footer and a 43-footer. And so nowadays, most record-breaking boats are trimarans. And there's a lot of benefits to them over catamarans performance-wise. Uh, and again, I don't want to go too technical in it because I, I know everyone follows sailing as much. But you're able to sail more efficiently with a trimaran closer to the wind, more power, um, and reaching conditions, which is when the wind's going across the side of the boat, like that. Um, and they're so much safer offshore that they haven't actually built a record breaking catamaran since 2003. Um, Bruno Perron, I think it was, uh, built Orange 2, and that was the last uh, record breaking catamaran to be built. Uh, so the direction even the Navy's going with the ships is towards primary hull boats as well for stability purposes. And so I included some cool videos here that was shot on board one of my buddy's boats uh, called Triple Threat. Um, we were sailing down to Annapolis, and uh, you can see just how the, the um, Lewitt Hall works in the water. Uh, and so one of the cool things about that 
is that we're able to scale super fast. So you'll notice in the speedometer there, we're doing about 15, 16 knots just as a jib in the mainsail. And that's us out there out in the bay uh, trying to pass in front of the uh, freighter, which we did just behind the freighter, by the way. We didn't cut in front of them. But um, it'll give you an idea how much faster uh, and how much more stable these boats are in comparison. So, so that's good. the next slide here. All right, so I'm going to jump real quick to the records um, and why records versus pure racing. And so one of the cool things I got to do to make money <laughs> in college in particular uh, was um, because I, I was part of the network of boats on the East Coast and the, the Mediterranean, I got to actually help move very, very expensive sailboats, uh, what we call deliveries. And during these deliveries, um, I was just trying to make money, trying to you know, have fun on the sailboat. But a peculiar thing happened. Uh, when I was sailing with Bruce on board his Ocean Planet, his Open 60, we got to uh, see the August, no, we got to Charleston. We pulled in. And he said to me, jokingly, I think he said, but stuck with me, he said, uh, I don't know if there's a world record <laughs> for a passage this fast. From I think it was from New York, or no, from Norfolk, from Norfolk to Charleston, and that hit me. I'm like, a record from Norfolk to Charleston. That's interesting. And so I went back to an old map I had. My mom gave me when I was a kid of the world, and on the map there were these lines from city to city, like New York to Plymouth and Miami to New York. And it dawned on me that those routes are what we call trade routes. That's where the freighters and old um, clipper ships used to take to get from one port to another port. And as I started researching it, I started realizing those trading routes are still used today by freighters, and they're also used by sailors to break records. And so most of the uh, sailors out there who are out there competing, they're sailing the same routes that were sailed back in the 1800s and 1700s. And the goal has always been to try to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And so for those who have done deliveries, you know where I'm going with this because your job, a person hires you to move their boat for them. And so what happens, you're sitting there at the marina, you're looking at your weather map, doing your routing, and you realize that there is a gale coming your way and you'll be you know, sailing upwind for two days. And so it's better to wait two days so the wind turn around and push you to where you're going as quickly as possible. And so what's happening was that, uh, in a microcosm, kind of like uh, the movie Karate Kid, <laughs> where Mr. Miyagi had Daniel doing that wax on wax off thing, uh, paying the table. That's kind of what was happening with the record, all these uh, deliveries, where I was doing uh, an amateur version of records. And so what started happening is I started applying that knowledge to my actual racing and other stuff I've been doing with the boat. And that practice and that experience of moving boats actually led me down the path of just repeating it, but doing it this time as legal records. And so I mentioned the first two gentlemen, uh, Hey Seymour and Captain Bill Pickney in the beginning. And, and that's for their voyages. Their voyages were great um, trips, but they weren't records. Uh, they were what um, the World Sailing Record Council called performance voyages. Well, my goal is to do what they did, but do it under the guidelines and rules of the record council. Because for me, there's no point in me doing the voyage just to be the first African-American just to do it. I want to make sure when I do the record, I break the record and set the record and own the record as a person uh, more than just for the culture by itself. You know, for our culture, we don't have, of course, that many people in the industry that we look up to for the sailing stuff. And so my goal was to make sure I deliver for my people, make sure my everyone's able to enjoy it. But I don't want to just be the, you know, the black guy that does records. I want to be the best American that does records. That way I represent not just my culture, but my country. And then if it's a world record, then I represent the world. And that's the goal. So going to the next slide here. 
so I'm going to um, begin closing it down now for the next session here for you, everyone. And I want to stress a couple of important points about my program. Being eco-friendly and being environmentally responsible is a massive thing for me. Uh, I love the water. I love the oceans. I love nature. Um, my wife and I even installed uh, 30 solar panels on top of our house recently um, because we understand, we see the effects of climate change has on our planet. And when you're out in the ocean, you definitely see it. It's really depressing when you're sailing out there in the Gulf Stream and you see trash bags. You know, I've seen that. Uh, it's sad when you see, you know, images of marinas full of trash and stuff. So one of the things that's important to me, and one of the things we're going to do with my vote, is we're going to incorporate three different clean energy systems. And um, I mentioned Bruce and Ocean Planet Energy, and you can check out his website to see the systems, how they work. But one of the obvious ones is a wind vane, because you're on a sailboat, and the sailboat's moving, you have wind, <laughs> so that system works perfectly fine. Uh, solar power, the sun, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, most of the time the weather's pretty decent. So you can get lots and lots of power from your solar panels. And then the new system, a newer system, I should say, uh, you have Watt C and you have Ocean Vault, pretty much the two top dogs in this area. You have hydroelectric systems. So as the boat's moving through the water, you put this device behind the boat or under the boat, and the propeller turns and it powers the uh, charges the batteries. And for those who don't sail a lot, you have batteries on board the boat because you still have a radar, you still have computers, you still have autopilot, and you have to make water with the system. So when you look at the image here in the middle here, you'll notice that the three systems over there on the left-hand side are charging the batteries, which in turn powers the water system, powers the uh, charging system, power, powers the computer system. And so, we're not going to be a proof of concept system because I believe that these systems will make us more successful. Because so if you remove the diesel engine, you remove all the fuel you're carrying, you'll save a lot of weight. And weight is actually your enemy when you're on a boat like this. And so uh, other benefits, uh, as I said, you remove the diesel fuel, you remove the engine. Um, those who study thermodynamics, uh, you know that electrical systems are more efficient anyways because with less heat loss. And so, of course, when it's cold outside, the diesel engine provides a lot of heat, but you also can put electric heater in, in this place as well. So there's no excuse not to go all electric. And most of the teams out there, most of the races out there now are starting to go in this direction. Um, and then the final point being is that these people's systems are redundant. And so if you, if the records, and I put this picture right here on for a reason too, because the Ellen McArthur, um, her record farm ranch she used, when she was out there doing her records, her generator died on her in the South Atlantic. Now, fortunately, she was able to fix it. But had she not been able to fix it, her record would have been over. But if you have electrical systems where you have solar panels, you have wind vane, you have a hydro system, and you have enough redundancy that if one of those systems go out, you still have two other ones. And so that really matters. So in closing, um, first, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation, number one. Uh, number two, I just want to give you guys some key thoughts to take with you about my program, about myself. Um, first thing, uh, I have 12 world records that I'm aiming to break, and uh, those are going to be listed on the website uh, pretty soon. We're about to pit up, uh, so you can check that out. Uh, my goal is to sell solo around the world while I don't break any these records. Uh, I'm going to complete all my records with 100% eco friendly technology. Uh, I mentioned to you in the beginning about the documentary film, which the goal is to get to share the story, to inspire others, and have it be for free forever so that it's on YouTube or something, everyone can watch it and enjoy it. Uh, one of the cool things I get to do as well, I get to visit different places and talk to students and churches and groups about my story and inspire them as well. So um, later on, you'll see my contact information. If you're interested in joining the tour, if you reach out to me, contact me. And um, we'll uh, try to get you guys on the schedule as well. And the final point is to inspire other generations of sailors. Because, again, legacy is about what you're leaving behind. You know, how are you going to make the world a better place than you found it? And um, nothing will make me happier than to first set the records and then have someone come behind me and break them. 
because the relevance of the record is the record's not broken, then the record doesn't really matter. And so after I break the records, I hope somebody comes behind me and then says, you know what, I can do better than that. And then, then break the record for me. So in conclusion, um, if you want to follow the story, follow what we're doing, see the images and videos we already have, you're welcome to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Captain Don Lawson. Um, if you're interested in partnering with us, you see the eight partners we already have down below. If you're a business, a company wants to join in, uh, just send me an email at donald at captaindonlawson.com uh, or hit me up through Facebook or Instagram on the instant messages and we can talk that way. So again, I want to thank everyone for listening in today. I hope uh, the presentation was enlightening. I hope uh, that everyone got something from it. And um, again, if you're interested in the tour or partnering with us, just reach out to me. All right, take care. Okay, well, we've got a few questions. First of all, give us a snapshot of this boat you're building. Where are you in the build? Uh, I know originally on your website, you were talking about doing the 2020 Vendee Globe. Now with the coronavirus and financial challenges going on, um, you mentioned uh, to me in a, pro yeah. a previous conversation that 2020 Vendee Globe is not on, in the cards right now. But tell right. us a little bit about the boat you're, you're building. And if you can, just give us a few of these 12 world records that you're, uh, that you're trying to break. Okay, so uh, for those who don't know, the Vendee Globe is a solo, it's a solo nonstop around the world race. It's held every four years. Uh, it's held literally uh, the same year as the Olympics. Um, the next one is scheduled to start this November. Uh, knock on wood, pray that it actually goes through because um, these teams have put a lot of time and money into it. Uh, I would not be able to do it this year uh, for lack of funding, but 2024 is still in play. Uh, there's some uh, folks who've been trying to help me make that happen. And so uh, if that happens, then that will be one of the directions we actually go. Uh, in the intimate time right now, uh, we, are, we have two boats that we're looking at purchasing right now, uh, both of them in Europe. Uh, one actually happens to be a trimaran, the other one happens to be a monohull. And depending on how much money we finish raising uh, at this point in this difficult time right now, will determine which boat we actually purchase. Um, the, the trimaran uh, is probably the ideal boat for the time being uh, because it's not as expensive, but it's in great shape. Uh, but the image I have right in front of me on the screen right here, just to give everyone an idea, that's kind of what we're looking at for the time being. Uh, it's easier right now, especially in the economic conditions we're in right now, uh, to purchase a, a used boat versus trying to build one right now. Okay, answer the question. And uh, now what about a couple of the records that you're trying to break? All right. Yes. So um, I'm going to jump back real quick. Here we go. So if you get a chance, guys, visit this website here, uh, the World Speed uh, World, World Sailing Speed Record Council, and what you'll see is there's a list of about 50 different world records on there. And so the 12 that I have identified, a couple of them are right here in the United States. Uh, one is the Miami to New York record. Uh, the second one is the Newport to Bermuda record. Uh, there's, there's about three transatlantic records uh, up north from New York to uh, England and back up there as well. And then, uh, of course, the other around the world record. And right now in the United States, uh, the record holder for the fastest circumnavigation is held by Rich Wilson. Uh, he broke this record last uh, four years ago. Uh, I think it took it down two days, to like 105 days. So one of my goals is to actually set the American record for the fastest circumnavigation. Um, so that, that, that's the big one for us right there. Okay, um, here's another question for you. You know, the, there have been a lot of uh, role models in other sports. Tiger yeah. Woods in a non-conventional sport of golf for, for people of color. The, the Williams sisters in tennis. Some people look at you and they say, hey, Captain Donald Lawson, he is our role model. He's a black man in the sport of sailing. How does it feel to be a role model and a hero for a lot of minority kids in a, in a non-conventional sport? Well, it's honor uh, to be viewed that way. Uh, I would 
I always tell students when I first talk to them that even though I may be the role model they have right now in sport and sailing, it's important to note that Tiger and Serena both have dominated their sports for a couple of decades. And so for me to be on that same pedestal, I have to earn that spot. And that's what this program is about. It's about me breaking these records so I can get to the level where people can see me like you know, Tiger Woods or Serena Williams or even Lewis Hamilton, who's another one of my guys I look up to in Formula One. Um, so as I go through this journey, uh, Michael Jordan wasn't Michael Jordan, so Michael Jordan became Michael Jordan. <laughs> so it's the journey that I um, want everyone to come along with me on so they can see the process because there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be some records we try to break that we're not going to break the first time because, you know, things on both break. Uh, weather systems change while you're out there sometimes. And so the journey of actually setting these records and doing these things, I want everyone to share that with me. And so I hope that it does inspire others to say, you know what, he did that really well, but I can do better. And then that, that's the essence of the program. Awesome. Well, one last question. So you, a lot of what you're doing is related to education and bringing along the next generation of sailors. U.S. Sailing is super passionate about STEM education through our REACH programming. And there are thousands of kids around the United States that are, are doing science, engineering, technology, and math with their REACH educators. How can they follow you as you take on these quests and, and go on your journeys? How can they be part of this educational experience? Excellent, excellent question. I'm very passionate about education because I've taught sailing for about two decades now. And so one of the most important parts of the program is we're going to have a STEM education uh, focus where we're, we're gonna have a system where schools and community centers will be able to track us live throughout all the records. They'll be able to talk to us while I'm doing the records. And then we're also gonna have a program where I actually come and visit the schools as well and share the stories with them. And so right now we have a couple of schools and I think one charter school in particular that we've been talking with and they're basically on board now uh, with us as kind of the, the pilot program for our education program. But if there are educators out there right now who think this could be a good program for their schools, I would invite them to also reach out to me and do it sooner than later so that we can get them the information they need and they can start processing the information for the next school year, for example. Excellent. Well, in closing, there, uh, you know, the famous quote that was uh, that was said by Maverick in Top Gun: "I feel the need, the need for speed," and that sounds like it's you, Donald. And we certainly look forward with our with our constituents at U.S. Sailing to following your speedy journeys around the planet. And uh, we hope that you set many records along the way. And we really look forward to following you through that all. So I hope all of you that have been out there listening today and those that will watch um, uh, the recorded episode of this will help, help us get more people of color involved in our sport that we can follow this, uh, this really experienced sailor on his journey. I mean, I envy you in being able to do it, but we welcome you into our US sailing family and to the family of sailors all around the country that have that same passion that you exhibit for this wonderful sport of ours. So thank you, Donald. Thank you, Captain Lawson, for being part of the Starboard Portal today. And we hope you'll join us again sometime. Absolutely. And Betsy, thank you so much for being a leader in the industry. I've known you for, I met you in 2004, I think. You've always been the same. So thank you so much. You are very welcome. And for those of you who are listening, please support the efforts of US Sailing. Uh, through membership. Membership matters. Thanks to our U.S. Sailing members, our services and programs continue to adapt and evolve to better serve the sailors like you through, especially through programs like the Starboard Portal. Visit us at ussailing.org uh, and join U.S. Sailing today. Thanks so much. And thanks again, Captain Lawson, for joining us. Thank you guys so much. You guys take care. <laughs>